everyone, and welcome to Virtual Live at Frost Science. We're so happy to have you join us here today for this very special celebration, all themed around World Oceans Day. And we're very excited to have our special guest. He is our VP of Animal Husbandry and Marine Conservation here at Frost Science, Andy DeHartz. And he'll be giving an amazing presentation today that teaches you a little bit more about some of the very cool marine conservation work we're doing right here at the museum with wonderful partners around the community that are helping us to be able to make a difference in the world oceans. How are you doing today, Andy? Doing pretty good. How is everybody out there in the uh, virtual world? <laughs> uh, hopefully they're all doing as great as we are here. Um, and so Andy, I wanted to ask, what made you get into kind of aquariums and marine conservation and, and, and being in this field? Sure, I will, I'll cover that a little bit in my slides, but I, for me it started when I was really young. I saw my first shark at age five snorkeling with my dad in the Florida Keys. And uh, from there, that was uh, a fairly life-changing experience. Got to get started in aquarium work at the age of 15 and have been doing it ever since. That's amazing. Well, I don't want to keep you from your presentation, so please, by all means, go ahead and get started and take over the screen. Um, okay. While he's doing that, just so you all know, if you've never been to one of these before, just go ahead and comment directly in the Facebook Live feed, and we will get those questions to him as quickly as we can throughout the presentation. So Andy, please take it away. Okay, well again, my name's Andy. I'm uh, gonna talk to you guys about some of our work here at Frost Science regarding ocean and marine conservation. Um, there will be a, a point to this title as you'll see along the way, but essentially from Finding Dory to the, to the Super Bowl experience, uh, it all ties back into ocean conservation. Um, as mentioned for me, uh, I got started uh, in my passion for ocean science, marine science, and all things fish. Uh, from a very young age, I started snorkeling at four, saw a six-foot Caribbean reef shark at the age of uh, five or six years old, snorkeling with my dad in the Florida Keys. Um, grew up in the uh, Annapolis, Maryland area, so I was able to get started at the National Aquarium uh, in Baltimore there at the age of 15, selling tickets, which led me into uh, work on the animal side of things. And uh, through my career, I've helped actually open three major public aquariums in the country. Uh, the first being the aquarium at Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo. Uh, I also kind of returned from there back to the National Aquarium in both their Baltimore and Washington, D.C. locations. Also got to open uh, Ripley's Aquarium of Canada in Toronto uh, in 2012. Uh, through, that, uh, through much of this time, I also got to serve as the shark advisor for the Discovery Channel. Um, and then in uh, 2015, came here to Frost Science to open my third and uh, hopefully final <laughs> aquarium along the way. The, each of these uh, progresses is, uh, is an amazingly hard job, 100 hour work weeks trying to get ready for opening. So every time I do it, I say I'm never going to do it again, but here I am, but hopefully I uh, will stay here in uh, the wonderful city of Miami. Uh, we do have not just our, our aquarium here at uh, Frost Science, we believe as, as good stewards of the earth by having an aquarium here at Frost Science that we need to be heavily committed and involved in marine conservation. Uh, when I started here, we did have a, a great raptor rehabilitation program, which I'll touch on. And we also had a program uh, looking at mangrove restoration. So what we wanted to do was add to that complement, really bring in the marine um, component to it. And uh, we came up kind of with three main spokes to our wheel as we say in the conservation world here at Frost. And the, the, the main things that we look at are habitat restoration, exotic species, and uh, kind of a third catch-all bucket, which is called treasured taxa. That means these are specific, unique species that we can focus on and work with con uh, conservation of these specific animals, it, but also kind of fall in the framework of our overall conservation plan. So, as I mentioned, one of our key components is habitat restoration. We do that both through coral reef restoration work as well as mangroves. And what this unique image shows you here is that they're, they're all connected. The land, and unfortunately this is a nice piece of land that's full of trees, often here in our urban environment, like here in Miami, that land component is filled with uh, non-pervious substances like concrete, tar, asphalt, um, which all plays a role in the downstream effect of our waters. As rainwater hits the land, it washes land into the 
mangroves uh, and the marshes, then into the seagrass beds and then into the coral reefs, all affecting this one gigantic ecosystem, which plays a vital role in not just kind of the ecological success of this system, but also the commercial viability. Many of these systems, again, are, are related. So the large snappers and groupers that people like to eat and commercially fish for off the coral reefs, they start their lives in the mangrove forests or the seagrass beds as juveniles. But the other really key component here in South Florida that you'll see, every single one of these environments, the coral reef, the seagrasses, and the mangroves, has a, has a downstream effect uh, in storm buffering. Each of these ecosystems helps buffer the natural storm systems that we get here in South Florida, like tropical storms and hurricanes. So infrastructure put into these, mangroves, coral reef, seagrass beds, all of the work that we do to help build up those ecosystems ultimately helps us on the land side as we deal with these stronger and stronger hurricanes and storms as we deal with climate change. So as I mentioned, one of our big key component programs that was here before I started is called MOVE. It's Museum Volunteers for the Environment. We actually have four specific sites. I can't tell if you guys can see through the map, but we have uh, our largest plot is on the north end of Virginia Key. Uh, we have uh, restoration of work that's been going on at um, the FIU's Biscayne Bay campus in North Miami. And then we also have two projects in uh, Grenolds Park, one in East Grenolds Park uh, and one in, in the regular Grenolds Park along the Alita River there. So in all this program, it really has looked to activate uh, our museum volunteers. We also get a lot of work groups from com big companies that want to do a work day. Um, we take these groups out into the environment, remove uh, non-native vegetation, and restore that environment with native vegetation. In total, we've uh, cleared up and worked on 11 acres of coastal habitat. Again, four sites in Miami-Dade County. We've planted roughly about 50,000 native plants and removed untold um, non-native vegetation that can be harmful or disruptive in that ecosystem. And we've worked with hundreds of volunteers uh, through the years. So this is uh, some photos of our site at Virginia Key. The photo on the left is all a non-native slash pine, Australian pine um, ecosystem. This is not a viable shoreline ecosystem. These trees also do not really help with breaking up the wind. They're shallow rooted and oftentimes uh, tip over causing great damage to power lines. And the, the image down on the bottom right is what that area looks like now. This is probably some most of the 11 acres uh, where it's been restored as a natural dune using native plants, native dune plants, and restoring that dune with sea oats. So Andy, this is incredible. I mean, the difference between these two sites is just, it's phenomenal what um, you know, the whole team and the community have been able to do. Is this something that anybody can volunteer to do? Do you have to be a certain age or um, is it really open for anyone who loves nature and wants to make a difference? It really is fairly open. All that information can be found on our MOVE page, on our, on our, uh, on our, on our webpage at frostscience.org. Uh, you can go to MOVE, you can go to the conservation page, but it is really open to all access. You can volunteer for scheduled events that are open. If you have a company that wants to do a company work day, you can find that information there. Our conservation manager, Shannon, does a great job of trying to find activities for a group of 25 to 50, even 100 people. Uh, we have FedEx uh, come out with us regularly. Wells Fargo has been a huge supporter of this program. They also bring their, um, their corporate members out, their corporate employees out to help with this project. So it's a great way to get introduced and on a fairly easy, although the beating sun takes its toll, kind of a, a low impact, shorter exposure to being in involved, getting dirty with uh, marine conservation. So this is kind of what some of that work looks like. You can imagine this was uh, right at the beginning. We ended up using bulldozers with the city and the county to clear a lot of the non-native vegetation out. We also removed uh, quite a bit of the topsoil so that any seeds and pods that were in that topsoil were removed so they didn't come back as weeds. And this is a group of volunteers uh, out planting many of these sea oats that ultimately end up holding that, um, that sand dune together. And then this is an aerial view of that same beachhead. Um, the pond that you see there, surprisingly enough, uh, just a couple of years ago, it was found that American crocodiles, which are still listed as a protected species and have very limited numbers, 
have started using that pond as a breeding ground. So we have actually seen that where if you do the restoration, it'll come back. We're seeing uh, re kind of colonization of native birds, native plants, even some plants that we didn't plant there are coming back the native ones. So we are actually seeing full scale turnaround of this, this one environment. For us, the next step in this um, habitat restoration, shoreline restoration picture, we are looking at potentially taking some of the boat slips uh, at Museum Park for a park here next to the museum and seeing if we can do a living shoreline. This is taking a very artificial concrete bulkhead uh, scenario and seeing if we can quote unquote soften that environment with mixed use of environmental concretes, doing things in a different fashion and adding in the mangrove and vegetation components so that if someone does live along a seawall, they have, they're lucky enough to have a house water, they want to do something. Looking at innovative designs to soften that impact zone where number one, animals can come, vegetation can live as they, they take up carbon out of the atmosphere as plants, um, but also so they can, again, soften this storm energy so that we have less violent storms, less damage when these things do occur. So the other element of our uh, habitat restoration program looks at coral reefs. Um, so last year, uh, we've been involved in coral reef restoration for about five years now. Um, but this is a project that we got involved in last year that's continued into this year. It's called 100 Yards of Hope. It started at the advent of the 100 year of uh, celebration of the NFL football year. Um, so this was last year was the 100th year of the NFL. And in correlation with Super Bowl last year, we went out and planted 100 Acropora cervicornis, which is an endangered coral species, the Elkhorn coral species photographed here. We went out and planted a hundred of these colonies uh, on a reef, and now we're in the process of both fundraising, uh, grant writing, as well as active work to convert those 100 corals uh, into a bigger outplanting that would actually be the full length of a Super Bowl field, 100 yards, before the Super Bowl in Tampa next year. So this is very much a Florida initiative. Um, we've got multiple partners and I'm going to show you a quick video that our partner Force Blue worked on. Um, there will be a little lag in the sound compared to the video, but it'll, hopefully it'll get the point across and then I'll go into more details of this project shortly. It's been two years since Force Blue trained its first team of special operations veterans. What began as a novel way to utilize these elite warrior skills and training in service of our oceans and to return to them the sense of purpose and belonging they had in the military has quickly grown into a model of caring, cooperation, and positive change with the power to restore lives in the planet. We're rescuing at-risk frags of Elkhorn coral to help them breed over at those sites that were damaged by the hurricanes yeah. Irma and Maria. To take the training that we had and implement into real world use, that was one of the things I loved about the military is we had mission, we had purpose, there was something we were doing every single day and there was reason behind it. It feels good. That self-respect and dignity that I had from the Marine Corps, no challenge, no adventure, nothing has filled that space until Force Blue. Force Blue brings this ability to accomplish these amazing tasks. Instead of being able to save 20 corals, we might be able to save 200 or 2,000. We in here tonight with a group of veterans on a new mission. They become eco-warriors out to save coral reefs, and in some cases, themselves. News outlets across the country have told the Force Blue story. We don't advertise this as a therapy program, but the process of it is very profound for the people involved. Now, we have a rare opportunity to tell that story to the world. How does planting 100 corals in honor of the NFL's 100th season sound? Well, it sounds like they're making a difference. This year, in honor of the NFL's 100th season, Super Bowl 54 in Miami and America's military veterans, Force Blue will be spearheading 100 yards of hope, a football field-sized coral reef restoration project in the waters of South Florida. We're at the restoration site. So we've arranged the plot to look like a football field. So each buddy group is actually going to take one of the yard lines to outplant plant 12 corals to build the perimeter of the field. And then we're going to complement the inner part with a lot more of the high density restoration to really make it a beautiful site. And this is entirely different. Most of the things that I've done have been more on the demolition side. So this is pretty neat in the restoration side. Capitalizing on the platform afforded by the NFL in its centennial season, 
Force Blue and its scientific partners intend to make this the most comprehensive, most collaborative restoration effort ever mounted. But we need your support. Join us on this historic mission and help the special operations veterans of Force Blue showcase what's possible when we all care enough to care. Visit www.forcebluteam.org. So that was a project that we started last April. Again, there's been a hundred corals that went into the, into the uh, reef initially. We've had two other plantings since then. And uh, it is a great partnership between Frost Science, University of Miami, the Veterans Group Force Blue, as well as the Super Bowl uh, Committee, NFL Green, and uh, starting as with us as of next year, because the Super Bowl will be going to Tampa, will be joining us will be the Florida Aquarium as well as the Sea Corps organization. So this is a multi um, organizational effort that includes both nonprofit environmental agencies, public aquariums, universities, as well as veteran groups. And one of the most amazing things about this program is we're able through this diverse group to be able to talk to people from both sides of the, the spectrum, both sides of the aisle, the folks that want to support uh, kind of reintroducing veterans into conservation work might contribute to Force Blue. Those interested primarily in the natural history aspect of it and restoring a reef uh, can come through us or University of Miami. So it really is a, a well-rounded kind of well-orchestrated machine that hopefully will end up with a result of a, a fully restored reef. So this is incredible work. I mean, what you all are doing, I. I honestly don't have words for it. I love this project so much and, and how many connections it's bringing together. But we did have a question from Lori. She's wondering, why are the corals dying in the first place? Is it pollution? Is it something else? What's happening? That's a great, great question. Uh, unfortunately, here in Florida, for since about 2013, there's been a, a massive disease that's taken place along the coral reefs. It's called stor stony coral uh, disease. And it's killing corals at an alarming rate. And it's kind of trending south, which is contrary to what a lot of people would have normally expected, but it is trending south down the Keys. Uh, it's affecting certain coral species more than others, um, but it is affecting a lot of these hard reef building coral types. And unfortunately, as we've found is, unless we intervene, um, we are seeing massive reef loss. We don't know whether this was a, a, a viral or, organism, which we think it may be, uh, or might be a portion of it. We don't know if the onset of this was pollution related. Uh, there's still a lot of variables that researchers around the state, or all around the world are working on to see kind of what is the origin of this. We do know that there's been a lot of stressors to our reef systems here in Florida. There's pollution, uh, there's much warmer conditions. In the last six years, we've seen record warm temperatures both in the water and, and out uh, in air temperature. We've seen massive, you know, category four, category five hurricanes in the Caribbean basin. Um, so we are seeing a lot of stressors to this environment, pollution, plastic pollution. Uh, we know from experimental work that, uh, you know, we, we've heard about microplastics in fish uh, and fish and that those plastics ending up into the seafood that we eat. But we've also known the corals actually have an affinity. They, they like supposedly the taste or the texture of those plastic microparticles and they are taking those in, they're ingesting them. So we're not sure what the tissue problem is or where the, the onset of the, of the disease came from, but we are seeing this alarming loss of corals. So when we go out, uh, one of the, the elements of this project is to work with corals from the University of Miami uh, nursery and they've been playing around with the genetics of corals uh, and we've worked with them on that project as well to look at which corals can tolerate those warmer temperatures better than others and use those more hardened corals in these outplanting events so that we're not duplicating efforts when the next heat wave comes through. So we've seen tremendous growth at that site. Um, we've seen these corals take on a, a you know, much larger size than, than they should probably do in that short of time. We're also anecdotally seeing a lot of fish diversity come back to this reef site. And this is right off of Key Biscayne and uh, pretty much well within reach of downtown Miami for those people that want to snorkel and dive. Uh, so this, we're not just kind of doing this in a, in a reef that is in the middle of nowhere. This is critical to Key Biscayne and, and downtown Miami. 
these are again some of the some of the players here. Um, you know, for myself, I grew up in Annapolis, Maryland, outside of the gates of the Naval Academy. My dad was a Navy diver, um, so for me, this is a really cool full story circle. Getting getting to hang out with my superheroes, the Navy SEALs, uh, and then that, talking sharks and talking corals with these guys, and they're just as interested in what what we're doing as, as and we are of of what they've done to protect this country. So it's it's been a really neat uh, program that we've been luckily to be involved in. One of the kind of we've left kind of habitat restoration is one of the key spokes to our conservation programs here at Frost. The next topic we get into that we that we focus on is exotic species. Our focus primarily is on marine exotic species. A lot of people wonder what's the difference between an exotic species and an invasive species. Essentially to boil it down an invasive species is one that has become established whether it's been brought in unintentionally or intentionally. Um, it's in the environment and not only is it established, it's breeding, um, but unfortunately the big factor here is that it's harmful to the ecosystem. So things like the lionfish, uh, those are animals that initially were exotic species, enough of them found each other so that they could have a, a stable population. And what we found with lionfish is they, they are truly invasive species. They're the perfect invader. They're venomous, they have no natural predators. Even in their native range, they don't have na uh, natural predators. Uh, they're very quick to reproduce. They lay thousands of eggs at a time. Their reproductive strategy is very successful. Um, so this, this has allowed the lionfish to, within you know, the frame of a few years, go from a few sightings in Flora, Florida to up to Bermuda, North Carolina, and then it circumnavigated the Caribbean. So what we're looking at is a whole host of other exotic species um, that are not yet established, may or may not have long-term ecosystem issues, but our goal is to remove these exotic species before they become invasive species. Because once they're invasive, they're, they're very hard to get rid of. So we're part of what's called an early detection rapid response program for marine exotic species. Um, the lead on this is the USGS, uh, US Geological Survey. And from a, from a federal standpoint, they monitor all invasive species, both plants, animals, insects, uh, and they're looking both freshwater, land, terrestrial, and in the marine environment. We also partner with an agency known as REEF, the REEF Environmental Education Foundation. Uh, they have been working for decades uh, getting recreational scuba divers doing fish watching surveys, much like Audubon surveys do with birds. The REEF organization uh, monitors and does regular surveys of fish using recreational divers. So we rely on them uh, as kind of a, as a, a point. And if they get reports of these fish that don't belong uh, in the local waters, that goes through the reporting tree, through their, their survey process. <coughs> Excuse me, USGS is mobilized. And then our role in this rapid response program is we actually physically look at what the data is, what the species is, where it was found, and try to mobilize a collecting effort and oftentimes we're able to do that within 48 hours. Um, the crazy thing here is this oftentimes involves tons of permitting. It'll happen in the National Marine Sanctuary. It'll happen in a, a state park. Uh, we, have, we have permits to collect fish for the aquarium, but oftentimes we're excluded from certain zones, which is great. We don't, we don't want to normally be collecting in the National Marine Sanctuary, um, but it is important that we use the USGS and our relationships with the Florida Keys, as well as local state parks to get the proper permitting to do this work. But oftentimes we're able to be in the water 48 hours post sighting uh, to mount a collecting effort to remove these exotic species from the local reefs. And then we actually have an exotic and invasive species exhibit here at Frost that most of these animals, if they're, if they're the right size, come back and are part of that permanent exhibit here at Frost so that people learn about the dangers of invasive and exotic species. We also have a couple other larger Indo-Pacific uh, coral reef exhibits where these animals go. So for example, in just the last five years, these are the species that we've responded to. Uh, fox face, Picasso triggerfish, sailfin tang, yellow tang, batfish, humbug uh, damsels, um, and there we go. We have finding dory. So now you've seen how we've gone from the Super Bowl to finding dory, uh, the pallet surgeon fish on the bottom right. Um, so all of these animals are barely very heavily imported animals for the pet trade. 
So our firm belief is that these animals are not coming in um, from ballast water, from container ships. They're not coming in um, in other fashions uh, on oil rigs. These are animals that are, have clearly been intentionally released by home aquarium owners. And unfortunately, most of these home aquarium owners probably are trying to do the right thing. They've got a fish, they have to move or it gets too big for their aquarium. They probably go back to their local pet store and say, hey, can I turn this in? And most pet stores are not set up to handle that kind of situation. So we've been working at, with the next kind of tier of this program is to look at pet amnesty programs. There's great pet, pet amnesty programs uh, that have been run by Florida's Fish and Wildlife Commission. We, and they've been mo mainly focused on kind of some of the other animals like lemurs and, and monkeys. And what we hope to do is provide a, an aquatic component to that, partnering with uh, Zoo Miami and uh, really kind of take on one of the, the problems to this process is, is homeowner or pet owners not feeling like they have a place to go. Uh, we can use our public aquarium network to, to, to home a lot of these animals. So all of these animals are ones that we've responded to. We have about an 80% success rate on catching these. And it may seem crazy, but you know, within 48 hours of some recreational diver seeing a fish, we've got a team in the water that not only can find that one particular fish on a huge reef ecosystem, but also catch it using hand nets and bringing it safely back to frost for um, being an animal on exhibit. So again, this is, just the species that we've worked on in the last five years, there's about 42 different species that have been seen in Florida waters. And uh, this is just the last five years worth. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And all these fish are absolutely beautiful. So I can see why people might be interested in having them. Um, but I had a question about, about this. Um, when we, um, catch them and we bring them here and show them on display, it's obviously an educational opportunity. But how many of these are actually a risk of becoming invasive, like the lionfish? All of them? None of them? How does that work to kind of distinguish them between those two classifications? Sure. Each one of these has a various kind of threat level. We, we, we give a lot of these species almost a threat assessment. Um, there are species that have been found in Florida waters, like a panther grouper. Um, which is a really large grouper that's black and white spotted. It's very common in the pet uh, industry. We, we're very worried about that species or any of the venomous species because we know that they can easily um, feed on the native fish population, but also displace. And that's really the worry with most of these species here is that we're not really worried about a, a direct negative impact on the environment. A lot of these surgeon fish, there's actually one, two, three, four, four surgeon fish, five surgeon fish on this list. We have three surgeon fish species here in the Caribbean and the Western Atlantic. And the, the worry is that um, these species might displace our native species and make them more rare, um, push them kind of out on the fringes. Um, although they probably wouldn't have a negative environmental impact, they'd probably fill that same niche that our, our surgeon fish fill, but we are con cognizant that they might displace our current ones. Other ones like the trigger fish in the top middle, uh, that's a fairly unique fish here and, and could play a role in environmental damage on what it's feeding on. Um, and then the top left one is a, an, is a uh, venomous species called a fox face. That whole family of fish does not exist in the Caribbean. So we are worried about kind of genetic issues as well. So again, kind of to, to finding Dory, this was unfortunately one we, we did score a home run on. Um, we got reports from Phil Foster Park uh, up at Blue Iron Bridge. This is one of the most heavily uh, sought after dive sites uh, in the United States. Uh, there are literally thousands of divers here on a weekly basis. Uh, we got very quick results where someone posted a video on Facebook of the uh, pallet surgeon fish Dory swimming around at Phil Foster Park. Um, we started looking, another dive shop had another report of this same fish. So that's when we mobilized. The, one of the reports went to Reef, and then uh, USGS got involved. This is a, a, a heavily protected area. Um, as of last year, this entire park is a non-collecting zone, which we have fully endorsed. Um, it is a very unique habitat, and Frost Sciences is adamant that this should stay a non-collecting 
area. So we had to get very um, top level permits to be able to even work in this environment. We brought a street team with us to talk to the other divers in the area to number one, see if they'd seen us fish, but also explain what we were doing. Um, so we actually swam every square foot of this park uh, within 48 hours of the initial sighting and we were never able to see the fish. So typically what happens in this situation is we'll then create a wanted poster like in the Wild West, um, put together a finding dory poster and uh, leave it with the local dive shops as well as kind of the local operators if it is a park environment or a shore diving location like this um, with contact information so that people do continue to see it. We also work with the local diving clubs. There's a huge uh, diving photography club here uh, at Blue Heron Bridge. So we work with that group to just kind of pass the word along that if this fish is seen later, uh, to let us know immediately. And we have not gotten a report of this animal. So either it went on its way, moved to a different location, um, or it, it didn't make it in its new environment. Sometimes when these animals are dumped into the ocean, uh, they're kind of in bad condition, their owners didn't take great care of them, or they were not acclimated, you know, very slowly to this environment and just the stress of different pH and different temperature uh, can cause the animal to not be doing well. So we don't know what happened in this case, but uh, unfortunately Dory is still on the loose and uh, we've got our network working on whether we can find it again. So then the last kind of range of our program, go ahead, Angela. Yeah, we just had a quick question about those. Um, Sarah was asking if any of these fish, because I know I've heard lionfish is actually quite tasty, can be used for food. Yeah, pretty much most of them can be used for food. Um, the one thing with lionfish is, is because they are established, because they are invasive, we are looking at ways to thin their numbers. And from a um, dietary standpoint and from a taste standpoint, lionfish is actually a really good fish to eat. Uh, many people actually use the Seafood Watch program to, to look at sustainable seafood. There's a green, a yellow, and a red level. Well, the, the lionfish is a gold level. It's the only animal that I know of that you can actually eat and actually be helping the planet in the process, provided that they came from the Caribbean. So if you do see lionfish on the menu at various restaurants, which we're seeing more and more, they are being sold at Whole Foods. Um, there's actually a lionfish cookbook uh, that one of our staff here at Frost Science helped write. It's called the Lionfish Cookbook. Um, so it's a, it's a great utility to have in your pocket. If you do see lionfish, be daring. Uh, there is a big difference between venom and poison. Venom is something that needs to be bitten into you or injected into you like a lionfish that has po uh, venomous, bar venomous spines at the top of its body. Um, and they are not poisonous. Poison is something you need to eat, like a poisonous frog or poisonous plant. Um, that is poison. So lionfish are very safe to eat, but you don't want to get stung by it. Although it's not deadly, it does hurt. I can tell you that firsthand. So our next category is treasured taxa. Again, this is kind of our, our catch-all bucket of how do we focus on unique species work. Coral restoration work involves the whole ecosystem. So does mangroves. Um, but there are certain elements of, of animals that we want to work with specifically. Sea turtles, uh, raptors, and the picture on the left is our um, pillar coral. So one of these that we've been a long-standing program here uh, at Frost Science, even back when we were at the Miami Science Museum in Coconut Grove, we have the Falcon Bachelor Rehabilitation Center, um, funded and sponsored by the Bachelor, uh, Bachelor Foundation. And this is our place where we actually are able to, to serve as a, as a tool for the community. So we have a full-time veterinarian and we have rehabilitation staff that can take in any injured or wounded bird of prey. So that's a falcon, an owl, a hawk, and an eagle. We will take in other native prey. We don't take in Muscovy ducks because they're invasive. We don't take in Egyptian geese because they're invasive or feral cats, but we will take in other native animals and do critical care like squirrels, um, skunks, anything that's native, um, gopher tortoises. We'll rehabilitate, get to care, and then we'll pass on to one of our rehabilitation partners. So our real focus is uh, raptors and birds of prey. Um, so you can see here the x-ray is a bird. Uh, that has a shattered wing. Most of our cases come in um, through a variety of ways. A real common one is people doing tree uh, service in their, in their lawn. They'll actually not pay attention and they'll cut down a big limb that has a, a nest of baby birds in it. Oftentimes these are screech owls. They're injured during the fall. 
We get a lot of collisions with cars, uh, which usually results in broken wings or skull fractures. Uh, unfortunately, even though all of the birds of prey are protected by federal law, we do get quite a few gunshots, people that try to shoot the falcons and the hawks in their backyards. And then we unfortunately get quite a bit of poison cases where um, someone's been using rat poison or mouse, mouse poison to get rid of pests or, or nuisance species in their yard. And then an owl or an eagle picks up that rat that's been killed by pesticides and then unfortunately it passes through the chain. So um, we do have this rehabilitation program. Unfortunately right now it's, it's kind of on furlough, uh, not because of the COVID crisis, but as we moved out of the uh, Miami Science Museum in, in Coconut Grove, uh, we had a great exciting opportunity to build a new rehab facility at Grenolds Park. Uh, so that's a project that we're under underway with right now. It's going to be a state-of-the-art facility with new uh, digital x-ray equipment, a new facility, top-of-the-line equipment, um, ability to share imagery with other facilities, and better holding facilities, including a really long flight cage, which is required at the end of the rehabilitation process as we want to transition all of these birds from an injured status to a release status. Um, but the last phase is putting them in a long, 80 foot long flight cage where they're actually eating live prey. We, we give them farm raised mice. Um, so they're actually regaining their ability to hunt. Um, and then once they're able to prove they're capable of, net, of, of unhindered flight and unhindered hunting ability, we are able to release them. Unfortunately, in any rehabilitation situation, sometimes you do get animals that are too injured to be released, but still are capable of having a, a great life. And many of those are, are the birds that we have here at Frost Science. We have a couple screech owls that were deemed unreleasable by the federal government. Uh, we have ibis that have been deemed unreleasable. And we work with, again, a partnership of rehabilitation and nature centers to place these animals that, that can't hunt because they have a broken wing, or they can't navigate because they have a neurological problem, but are still great animals that have a long life ahead of them. So we are able to place many of those animals, um, but still ultimately save their lives. So here's a couple photos of some of the released work that we do. The little cute guy in the towel is a screech owl, and we actually have some owl boxes at the Vizcaya Museum, uh, where we actually take these owls over to these owl boxes and are able to release them right on the, the wonderful grounds of Vizcaya. Um, the one up top is what we would call a more active release situation. These would typically happen with the larger raptors. We've even re released some peregrine falcons off the roof of our museum here because they're a, an, an urban uh, bird of prey. And so that would be a situation where this animal has been fully flight tested. It can hunt and it's ready to go on its own and start hunting and eating. So those are kind of two different release strategies that we have for these animals. The other kind of species focused big project that we're working on at Frost Science right now that ties directly into ocean conservation and, and World Oceans Day is uh, we've become an arc for the pillar coral. Now the pillar coral is probably one of the most charismatic coral species in the Caribbean and uh, the photo on the right is one of two arcs that we've built for this species. So uh, although this species is charismatic it, it's never been a very common coral here in, in the Florida coral reef. Um, like many corals, it's uh, loss from story cor stony coral tissue disease started pretty hard in 2013 and has been accelerating. Um, through this project, we partnered with NOAA, Florida Aquarium Coral Restoration Foundation, as well as the Keys Marine Laboratory. And what all of us as, as different organizations have done is gone out and taken fragments of either ones that were broken off or species that were starting to die that we were able to cut off healthy tissue before it reached um, and bring in all of these corals into arc systems at all of these places. Um, and currently there's over 500 fragments held by these four organizations uh, representing 123 genotypes. Now a genotype is essentially a genetically unique uh, individual. Um, so there's 123 unique genotypes that are being held by these four organizations. 112 of these genotypes are absolutely and totally extinct in the ocean. Um, so our, and Frost is holding 62 of those different genotypes in these two arc systems that we have. So the ultimate goal of this program would be to culture these corals, grow them up, potentially work at sexually reproducing these corals so that we could mix different genotypes to create hybrids, 
Maybe some hybrids are better at, at working with warmer temperatures. Maybe some hybrids might be better at, at resisting the, the coral tissue disease. We don't know, um, but the next step of this program is to work exactly uh, pairing these different coral species and working on coral spawning of this species for ultimately going back out and being part of a, a restoration effort like 100 Yards of Hope or any of the other restoration sites that are going on here in Florida. So we've had a couple of questions that, that have sure. come in around this kind of replanting, coral reef work. There's a lot of interest we have in it. So Seth asked a little while ago, but I think it applies um, for this bit too. What are the long-term prospects for corals being replanted? Are they the type that are naturally found there? Are there different types that have been brought in from the lab to fight potential disease or genetic challenges? It's a great question. And I would say our, our philosophy around this has changed with time. You know, I'm, I'm more of a shark biologist, uh, but we have a lot of, of coral biologists on staff here. And, and philosophy has changed over time. Very early on in the restoration process, the government, NOAA, who controls most of the waters in the United States, as well as the scientists doing the research in that area, were very hesitant to bring in a new genotype uh, of, a, of a coral into a new environment. They were worried that it would displace the natural genotypes. So a perfect example of this is one of the first restoration projects I worked on was the big giant elkhorn corals that, that were really common in the Keys. There's a huge stand of these Elkhorn corals in Puerto Rico, on the west side of Puerto Rico, that was doing very well, despite huge losses throughout the Caribbean. So for some reason or another, that, that genetically diverse colony in Puerto Rico was able to tolerate the storms, was able to tolerate the climate change, the warmer temperatures. But early on, we, did, we were very worried about bringing that strain to Florida mixing it with the existing strain and not really knowing what was going to happen. I think we're in a different place now of everybody on board understands that if we don't act now, we are going to lose 90% of the reef building corals um, on the Florida coral reef if we're not being aggressive with our restoration efforts. That being said, we all, we are still applying science to it. It's not just a grab bag of, okay, let's just throw a bunch of corals down. There is, there's a, a huge effort to try to look at where did these corals come from? What have they been exposed to? Um, so this is a perfect example. This, this pillar coral arc that we're building, we're talking years before we would ever feel comfortable putting these pillar corals back into the ocean. We're gonna want some really good data that shows that the disease has worked its way through Florida, that that we're not going to look at a rebound of if we put these corals out there. So again, the philosophy on keeping these corals in four different locations is also to protect that arc. So if, an, if a coral in our culture breaks with the disease, the ones at Florida Aquarium or Moat are kept safe uh, from each other. So we can spread out that diversity in genotypes, but also spread out that diversity and protect them um, from the various issues at play. So. Although we're being more aggressive with corals going back out, um, I'd say we've eased up restrictions a bit. The other thing we're looking at is a more holistic approach. So a lot of the early work on coral restoration has been done with uh, the, the first photo I showed you that we worked on with 100 Yards of Hope, the Elkhorn coral, the, the long, spiny, branchy looking stuff. That's great because it builds a reef very fast, but it builds a very fragile reef that breaks apart when waves come through. A critical part of big coral reefs is these large brain corals and boulder corals. So we are looking at that as the next phase. As we restore a reef, it can't just be elkhorn coral. It needs to be sponges. It needs to be brain corals. It needs to be sea urchins, which died off in the 1980s. It needs to be removal of al uh, harmful algae that's overgrown the reef. And that's really what we hope to be a showcase at the 100 Yards of Hope is, can we deploy all these different tools and look at restoring a reef, not just restoring the corals. So that's amazing. We did have another set of questions from Justine. They were wondering what divers can do to help with coral restoration and if frost science is in need of any experienced divers. Well, there's certainly a lot that, that recreational divers can do. There's a number of agencies. The one that we're partnered with is Rescue Our Reef, which is a UM program. 
and they actually do have the ability to take recreational divers that dive for fun uh, and engage them into this part of our coral restoration program that we're working with them. So although we're not at the point yet that we're running volunteer trips out there, we hope to get there someday. Rescue a Reef is our partner and they leave uh, typically out of Biscayne Bay, uh, Virginia Key area. They've, there's a marina there and they've, they've partnered with Paradise Divers, uh, which is a, a local dive shop to, to run volunteers out there. Um, you know, certainly every diver can help spreading the word. Um, I think a lot of people still think corals are plants, not animals that, you know, you can touch them and walk on them and feel, you know, they're going to survive. But I think what we've seen through time is that, you know, corals are a sensitive animal that, that need to be protected. And most importantly, divers can use their political voice, their voting voice, uh, when it does come time to changing commission rules within the FWC, changing, you know, harvesting seasons, changing where commercial fishing can happen, voting for a, a new marine protected area. Those are probably the most important thing that recreational divers can do, and that's using their voting voice. So um, that's kind of wraps up all of our programs that we're running here at Frost. Um, you know, what I think it is important to point out is that Although we do a lot with a very small staff and a very dedicated staff, all the work that we do on each one of these programs, whether it be bird rehab or uh, removal of exotic species or coral restoration work, this isn't done uh, through gate revenue. Every one of these projects is funded by an outside source, such as uh, Wells Fargo, which has been a great supporter of our MOVE program and the, the work of Virginia Key, or it might be a private grant through an environmental funder, or it comes through as, as general donations. So we actually do have a spot on our website. Uh, the link is right there. You can donate, and you can donate specifically to any of these unique programs. You can donate to the general operating fund, or you can specifically say, hey, I wanna to give to this. But one thing that I think is unique here at Frost Science is Conservation is integrated into at least our animal team and, and hopefully soon a bigger museum picture. There's a lot of our museum staff, both on the corporate and executive level, um, but also in guest experience exhibits that have helped out with our MOVE program. So they're, they're not just talking the talk, they're out there. Um, men, most of our, I would say, a good portion of our museum staff have at least planted a sea oat or helped clean up the beach from plastics. Um, but then our animal team are the ones behind the scenes, although they might be taking care of the hammerhead shark one day, part of what their role is within our museum is to be engaged and, and critically involved in these conservation programs. For us, that allows us to have them as better stewards as they're on the floor interacting with you guys as guests. They can now talk about these exciting programs that we're doing outside of the walls of the museum. Uh, they've been there, they've seen the reefs, they've seen the coral that they planted triple in size over the last six months. Um, so really that's it's key to our philosophy here at Frost Science is that, that staff are engaged, it's not a small team out doing the side projects, but it's, it's core to what we do and it's a, a core program, although we fund it uh, externally. So we do hope you'll stay engaged with Frost Science. We hope to be opening very soon, uh, maybe this week, I don't know, we'll see. Um, so we, we, you know, we've, as an animal guy, I always said my best job would be to run an aquarium where there's no people, but I miss the people. I miss having that interaction with people. I miss having uh, guests come through the doors. And it's an odd thing when an animal guy says, I miss the face prints uh, and the hand prints, which I think COVID will do away with uh, on the windows. But we do hope folks come back and, and engage with the museum in a safe environment. Absolutely, Andy, I couldn't have said it better. We do have some additional questions from the audience um sure. that I came in uh as you were presenting so Mari asked back when we were looking at move and a lot of that habitat restoration are the shorelines getting shorter over the years so what kind of impact is it having on them it is a, it's a very dynamic system and what we've found with storm energy is unfortunately when sand is pulled from one beach it's oftentimes deposited somewhere else Oftentimes that's another beach, either upstream or downstream, um, but sometimes that can be out at the sandbar where your, your favorite beach, if you go to it before a hurricane and after, 
sometimes it's a nice flat run and then after a hurricane you go back and there's some weird you know hump right out in the middle where you used to like to, to bathe so unfortunately the sand doesn't go anywhere it, it just moves um, and there are places very common here in South Florida where people are actually pulling mine sand from quarries and adding it to the to the beaches to, to keep them as a as a tourist attraction. So it, it's a it's a very dynamic and very odd situation. Wow. Um, well, thankfully we have wonderful team members here and elsewhere that are helping to restore those habitats. Um, yeah. She also wanted to know is red tide. Um, is that having any impact on the coral reefs or what's the relationship there? Well, red tide is a, is a natural process. It gets worse when there are more phosphates in the water, which there is a corollary to, um, you know, Lake Okeechobee and the water that comes out of Lake Okeechobee and the amount of phosphates in the ocean that does correlate pretty frequently with red tide events. Mm -hmm. Until about two years ago, there had never been a red tide event in Miami-Dade County. Um, and even the Keys, it's very rare, although, you know, I'll, oftentimes the water on the backside of the Gulf comes down to the Keys. But for the most part, Monroe County, Miami-Dade, and Broward have been relatively free of red tide, and that's where most of the coral reefs are. So as of this point, we're not seeing an impact between red tide and the, the coral reefs. Although, if we were to see a lot of phosphates in the water, it would have a similar problem in that the, the, the algae in the water would grow quicker. And that algae, unless it's controlled, has a real tendency to smother the corals and, and kill them. Yeah, we don't want that. <laughs> Definitely don't want that. Um, and then Sarah asks, can you make an owl box at your house? You can. And that actually is probably a pretty good idea for us to do for an at-home work project. I don't believe we have one, but that's a brings up a good <laughs> But yeah, you can. You can make owl boxes, bat boxes. Um, those are great things. If you do have a, a heavily forested yard, uh, those are fantastic things. And, and I'm sure there's lots of links on how to out there, but maybe that's a DIY process project for us later. Yeah, I'll add that to the list. <laughs> um, and then lastly, uh, Mari asked, uh, where can you find lionfish around here? Like where are they most commonly found? I wish I could say they were hard to find. Uh, our our seawater intake for the aquarium, we actually have a pipe that runs from the basement of the aquarium all the way out in front of the Perez Art Museum. Uh, we go in there and dive to check uh, to make sure it's not fouled. Every, every single time I go there, there's at least three or four lionfish on an artificial seawall. I'll see lionfish at 110 feet out on deep on the walls, and I've even seen lionfish in probably four inches of water in the mangroves. So unfortunately they are rather ubiquitous. Um, they do like structure. So you typically won't find them just out in the sand flats by themselves or in the seagrass, unless there's one big rock. And then even in the middle of a seagrass field, you might see 10 lionfish gathered around one big rock in the middle of the seagrass. So they are pretty much everywhere. And they're not small either, are they? They're getting pretty big out no. there. Yeah, I mean, you see all size classes. The, the crazy thing is there's been more research done on Atlantic lionfish than there's ever been done on lionfish in the Pacific. But we do know that the largest lionfish ever caught came from the Atlantic, not from the Pacific Ocean, so. No natural predators, they just get to eat. <laughs> Keep eating. Well, thank you so much, Andy, for your Absolutely. time today. This has been a wonderful presentation and a beautiful way to celebrate World Oceans Day. We'd like to thank our sponsor for this event, Miami Downtown Development Authority, uh, who's our wonderful sponsor for this one and sponsored Earth Day back on April 22nd. So thank you very much to them. This is our last virtual live at Frost Science for the time being. Um, so we thought we would end with a wonderful bang with Andy, um, talking about wonderful work we're doing here and ways that you can get involved by joining us. So if you visit frostscience.org, you can learn more about all of these programs that he talked about today, as well as um, you can view some of our old virtual lives back in April where we had our veterinarian, Dr. Kristen Dubay, talk about the animal care that goes on here. And also um, Shannon Jones, who was our, who is our conservation programs manager and runs MOVE. So you can learn and see her Earth Day talk to learn more about things you can do to help the environment. 
So thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Thank you, Andy, again for being our wonderful presenter. And we all hope you have a wonderful and happy World Oceans Day.